welcome to the uh, Allegro Common List certification program where we give an introduction, an elementary introduction to list programming. My name is David Margulies. I'm the manager of documentation at Franz Incorporated. I've been working with LISP and at Franz uh, since 1984. There's a little bit of history about uh, Franz Incorporated and a couple of links here. Um, and in particular, you should see technical support is the email address is support at franz.com. This is where uh, you report any technical questions or report any technical problems. And the email is uh, that email address is read by many people. It's always better to send questions uh, to a general mailing list rather than a specific person, uh, even if you know the specific person's email, because if that person's not reading email for a day, the general list is always being read. So we're going to have a two-hour presentation each week for three weeks. The lecture notes, that is, these uh, slides, and uh, homework is available at the um, web address you see there, www.franz.com slash lab. Uh, and you can send email to training at franz.com. Uh, again, that's the general email address that will see, be seen by various people. Now, the class is based on Allegro CL 8.2. But in this class, with very minor exceptions, we are doing standard common list. So everything we do should work in um, any version of Allegro common list, or in fact, any uh, common list. The, if we, we sell licenses to our programs, but there's a free version available on our website, www.franz.com. And uh, if you want one for your home computer or uh, any, uh, any other computer, uh, you can download a version suitable for your computer. Um, in this uh, course, we'll be using Allegro Common Lisp on Windows. And the Allegro Common Lisp also runs on many Unix platforms. Uh, but the user interface is somewhat different, and the development environment is somewhat different. So what you're seeing today on Windows, uh, the integrated development environment, environment also works on Linux and works on uh, the Mac, but um, uh, doesn't work on all other Unix or, in fact, any other Unix platforms. Documentation, which I didn't get corrected. You should take off the last um, 8.2 uh, uh, on this slide. I corrected the slide, but apparently didn't save it properly. Um, so it should say www.france.com support documentation. and the common list specification, which is the official description of the common list language, is also available as part of our documentation. And you can replace 8. This, this one will work, but you can replace 8.2 with current, C-U-R-R-E-N-T. And that one works even when we change the version number. And as I'll show you uh, shortly, uh, there are a couple of indexes that we have including the permuted index, and, the, and I will demonstrate the permuted index. Uh, and it's a way, if you think you know a word in a topic, but it may not be the first word, you can look it up in the permuted index, which indexes all words in, uh, in link names. Um, the, when you're running the IDE on Windows or Linux or the Macintosh, um, there are help functions, which I will demonstrate. In particular, there's help on any particular symbol, symbols, name, variables, or functions, or operators. There's help uh, for ANSI common list. There's links to the Allegro CL documentation. And um, there's also uh, what's called the tree of knowledge, which is a uh, large format tree which organizes the documentation in, in a particular way. Um, the, uh, so now we're going to start uh, the first uh, introduction um, with some basic list concepts. And um, you know, if you're new to list, then things are quite um, 
strange at the beginning if you're used to other programming languages, but over the uh, course of today and the next two sessions, you should begin to get uh, familiar with uh, programming in Lisp. Um, let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. A uh, little bit of history of Lisp on this uh, slide, just telling you that it's quite an old language. Uh, first uh, versions written in 1958, and it was um, made. Uh, there were many different dialects, but the standard dialect of today, which is called Common Lisp, was uh, developed in the 1980s and has been what people have been using since then. So let's uh, get right into uh, Lisp itself and start with one of the fundamental data objects of Lisp, of Lisp which is uh, the concept of a list. And a list is simply an ordered collection of objects represented in a particular format. Um, the way the print representation of a list uh, is zero or more elements enclosed by parentheses. So um, we have a list in the next bullet, open parenthesis. There are five elements, the number 17, the symbol red, the string green, the number, the ratio two-thirds, and the symbol blue. Um, let me just make a quick comment about the uh, uh, quotation marks in uh, green here. Uh, it turns out in Microsoft uh, applications, they often think they know better than you do what you want to do. And so you try and type a double straight quotes, which are what are typically used uh, in Lisp and in programming. And it comes up as these curly quotes. And getting rid of that turns out to be very difficult, so we finally uh, abandoned it. Um, and so you'll see curly quotes uh, and mentally change them to straight quotes, because that's what we want to represent. But Microsoft has defeated us there. Anyway, lists are the basic concept, the basic data element within uh, list programming. So as we will see, lists list source code consists of lists, and list data is often uh, collected uh, in lists, although there are other ways to represent data and store data, which we will get to. So uh, starting Allegro CL, um, if you're on Windows, you start uh, Lisp as you start many Windows programs, uh, typically as a submenu of a uh, item on the start menu. Uh, you can also have an icon for it on your desktop or all the usual ways to organize starting um, Windows programs. And once Lisp is started, you will get a prompt, and you can enter Lisp forms, uh, which we're going to describe, but basically function calls or things you want to evaluate to a prompt and evaluate what you enter, and you will get a response. Now, let me see if I can actually figure out how to start this. Um, somewhere down here should be the eh, work. I'm try it again. I'm trying to get the start menu. Um, all right, we're just going to start right here. And so here's all programs. Here is Allegro Common List 8.2. Uh, which the computer is taking a second to get to. Now, there are a difference between what are called modern images, which are case sensitive, and ANSI, or standard common list images, which are case insensitive. And we're just going to start a standard common list image. And we'll talk about the difference between them later. Um, so things start up. You get a little banner. Um, and you get a window which tells you that it's doing the set the next thing in startup. And then uh, you get a um, window that comes up that says the last time you were running, basically is saying the last time you were running this, this is what you were doing. Do you want to start there? And I'm saying no. So there we have a list running. And here we have a prompt. And you can type to the prompt. And I'm going to type something very uh, simple, which is I'm going to add. 12 and 13, and it's going to tell me the result is 25. We'll get into what I'm uh, doing um, 
there later. So now let me go back to the PowerPoint. And um, I think I have to do the slideshow and do show and just scroll ahead to where we were. Um, so we, this is where we were, starting Allegro CL with the IDE. And I've uh, shown that happening. And um, so I have the LISP program running. And um, just to uh, throw you into the deep end of the pool, we're actually going to start with a um, reasonably complicated function. And I don't expect people uh, to be looking at this to understand what's going on here. I just want to give you an example of a uh, common list function. Now, there's a concept in uh, mathematics called a factorial. The factorial of a positive integer, say 20, is the product of 20 times 19 times 18, the product of all the numbers from the argument number down through 1. And um, these factorials get quite large quite quickly. And um, it's an interesting question as to what is if you have, say, the factorial of 100, how many, and you look at it in decimal representation, how many ones are there in the decimal representation, how many twos, how many threes, all the way up to how many zeros. And uh, this list function, which I've written here, uh, is going to um, determine that. You give it the function name is count digits um, uh, of factorial. Uh, it takes a single argument, which appears there, called um, positive integer argument. So you give it a value, and that value, as the argument name says, has to be a positive integer. Um, and then it does some work, and it has a couple of auxiliary functions, one for calculating the factorial, one for counting the number of occurrences, um, of the various digits, and one for printing out the data. And uh, then we get results. Now, let me see if I can go back to the list. Um, there we are. So I already, um, as it happened, stored that um, the function that you saw in a uh, file called um, factorial fact x. Um, and, uh, you might see right there is uh, um, what was on those slides. To um, compile and load a, a source file, um, there are various ways to do it, as we will uh, describe. But um, let me just, there we go. Um, but one way is using uh, the toolbar up here. And there's a little uh, truck which means compile and load. So we click on that. It asks, what file do you want to compile and load? And it's the FACTX file. Um, and so it's done it. Um, you don't, uh, so we need a new prompt here. And so first of all, let me show you the factorial function. Here's factorial of 100. And there it is. Um, it's quite a large number. It's not wrapping. You just sort of see the number right there. Notice it ends with a lot of zeros. Now, um, let's call the function that we defined, which was count di. Now, in, um, when you're using the IDE like this, if you have typed in the beginning of the name of the function, which is starting with the function call, open parentheses, and then you type the function name, then you type the arguments, as we'll go into. But if you type the beginning and you hit control period, it will um, either fill it in if there's only one choice, or it will ask you, here are the possibilities, and you choose it. And we give it 100. And there you go. It says that there are 30 examples of zero in this. Um, uh, there are a couple. And there are quite a number of zeros, because, of course, it ends with lots of zeros every time a 5 or a a, a integer, so 20 adds a 0, 15 adds a 0, 10 adds a 0, 5 adds a 0. Um, so there are more zeros than there are anything else. 
let's um, do the same thing just to show you. Uh, I'm typing the wrong place. Let's get down here. So let's do count digits of factorial. And let's actually do 1,000 this time. And again, it's told you what it is. And notice that the number of digits except 0 are beginning to even out. Uh, and also notice there are about 230 um, of each of the digits, 1 through 9, um, which is about 2,000 digits. And there are about 500 zeros. So the length of uh, factorial of 1,000 is about 2,500 digits. And um, this is just demonstrating that uh, Lisp uh, finds it easy to deal uh, with very large integers. Um, it, it is uh, dealing with those transparently. Um, it's one of the powerful. So going back to Lisp, uh, here are the results. There's 100 that I just showed you. And here's the thousands again. So um, there's just a quick example of a fairly complicated program. We, um, you give it an argument, which is an integer. It calculates the factorial of that integer. It represents the factorial in decimal representation. And then it counts the digits. And then it prints the output. It is um, not the simplest program in the world to write in any language. Um, and so it didn't take a great deal of Lisp code, because Lisp comes uh, pre-supplied with a fairly large number of powerful functions, which are useful for these kinds of manipulation. Um, when you're using Lisp, um, you can add your own definitions directly by typing to the prompt. But the more common way, and what I just demonstrated, is that you have a source file with your Lisp source code. And you edit and maintain that file. And then you um, load, uh, compile, and load that file into the Lisp session. Entering a definition at a prompt or loading a file with a definition in it adds that definition to the Lisp session. It is available from then on. But of course, if you restart, if you, you end Lisp and restart it later, you have to reload the file or retype the definitions for the new session to know about them. And loading a file is the process of taking a uh, source file or the equivalent compiled file and loading it um, into the running Lisp session. And you can do this with the common list function load. In Allegro CL only, there's an abbreviated command, colon LD, uh, which is equivalent to saving you a lot of typing. So colon LD, myfile.cl, no quotes. Uh, in Allegro CL only, this isn't standard common list, is just gets translated to the form above, which is standard common list. And again, in Allegro CL, when running the IDE, there's a file menu. And um, uh, there's also, uh, as will be mentioned on a later slide, um, that little uh, cute truck icon, which indicates that you want to compile and load the file. Um, uh, to load a single definition from, if you're typing in the IDE, and let me just go back to the list again. So here we have uh, these function definitions. And you could have um, put the cursor on one of the definitions. This is the definition, <coughs> excuse me, this is the definition of the function print data. And the cursor is on the final paragraph. Notice that the editor is marking the corresponding opening uh, parenthesis. Um, so it's all, the cursor is on the, the final closing parenthesis, and the initial opening parenthesis is highlighted. Um, and there are keystrokes or um, uh, menu items which will say, please evaluate uh, this uh, function definition just as if you had typed it into the prompt. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. That's basically what uh, this slide is telling you. Um, and you have source files, which uh, look 
which are list source written in sort of English or in the programming language. <coughs> and of course, you can compile these files. Compiled files, compiled code runs faster than interpreted code. <coughs> Lisp has both an interpreter and a compiler. An interpreter means that it's going to read the source file. Here is the source file, and it's simply going to read the source file. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, read the source definition of the function. So here is the function definition. We're calling the function print data. We will get shortly to how to define functions. And it is giving a number of instructions basically saying print something and calculate some things and do some more printing. And when you're running interpreted, the system is simply reading and parsing this text exactly as it appears here. When you compile it, it converts this source text into machine code and simply executes the machine code when you call the function rather than looking at the source text. And of course, compiled code as I said, was faster. And when I say faster, I mean 10 to 100 times faster, so that if you're doing any kind of intensive computation, um, you always want to compile code. In fact, it's a generally a good idea um, to compile code in all circumstances, except if you have run into a problem and you want to figure out what's going on, running source code is a little bit easier because debugging it is easier. But otherwise, you generally always want to be running compiled code. And um, this is uh, explaining um, about, this slide's explaining about what it means to compile a list file. You end up with a separate machine code file, which is unreadable, but loads faster and runs faster. And you compile a file with the function compile file in Allegro Common Lisp only with the uh, abbreviated command colon cf, and um, uh, you can, it creates what's called a FASL file. FASL means fast loading, but it doesn't matter uh, what it means. It's just the uh, type of a uh, compiled file in Allegro Common Lisp is .fasl, and the system understands .fasl once you've installed Allegro Common Lisp on your system. It understands the um, extension FASL. Uh, you can load the FASL file. And also, there are compile and load items on the file menu when you're running the IDE. And yeah, here's a little mention of the truck icon. So you can compile and load a file at you know both actions with the same command. Again, the abbreviated uh, command colon CL and the file menu item or that little truck icon uh, that I actually used. There is no standard common list function to both compile and load a file. You have to compile with one command and load with another. But in Allegro CL and in the IDE, there are standard common list ways to do that. So, Lisp is a dynamic programming language. And dynamic means you can add or redefine functions while a program is running. You do not have to stop the program. Um, with uh, certain exceptions um, that are uh, more complicated than we're going to talk about now, if I redefine a function while um, a, another function is running, the next time it calls that function, it will see the new definition. Um, so you can, if you're running an application, you do not have to stop the application to put in a corrected function or to put in a new function. This makes for a very fast um, editing and debugging cycle. Um, and there's a programming trick when you are uh, creating a large program, and there are certain auxiliary functions um, which you need to define, um, is to uh, write a dummy stand-in function um, for uh, 
that Exodia refunction and either have the stand-in go to the debugger or have the stand-in return or a dummy values or uh, do um, dummy things. And let me just explain what this means using our example. Notice that at the end here we have this function um, print data. We we have a number of functions defined. There's the main function count digits and factorial here, and it calls various auxiliary functions. It calls the function factorial, which calculates um, the factorial of an integer, and it in fact calls a secondary function called fact, and then it calls a function that computes uh, how many times the digits occur, and then it calls a function which prints the data. Now suppose you're just working on the first bits of this factorial and the compute list of occurrences, but you've written the ma master program here that um, is structuring the whole operation. You might want to just have a dummy function, in other words, not figure out how to um, print the data and have a dummy function uh, down here. We know it uh, takes one argument, which is a list of counts, and so uh, the dummy function, um, if I can actually get this to, uh, what am I doing? There we go. Um, uh, we could have done defund um, print data, and I know it has to take one argument, and I have to spell it right, there we go, and um, so you just, you could um, define uh, that and have to close the second parenthesis. Notice how it's matching the parentheses as I type there, and therefore I'm able to tell when I close off all the parentheses. Um, so uh, I can have that. It won't actually print the results. I won't know if the results are correct, but at least it uh, will do something, and it will allow me to test for errors in the other more complicated functions. I'm just going to comment that out. Uh, so it doesn't leak into the program. And let me go back to the slides here. Um, so that's just a, a, a programming technique uh, that um, many of us use and I thought I'd mention. Um, people who are new to LISP um, run in uh, to a couple of um, issues uh, fairly quickly. One is uh, what we're calling weird, but perhaps I should just call unusual or unexpected syntax. And that involves the use of parentheses and the fact that the um, function, the operator name, comes first. So we want to add two values, the value of A and the value of B. Instead of A plus B, we use this list format where the operator plus goes first, and then the arguments. Now, this does get take some getting used to, but um, once you use parentheses, you get used to it pretty quickly. But once I, we're just, I just want to point out that the use the the, the specifying of these uh, formula using parentheses and using what's called the prefix notation, which is the function name going first, um, removes a great deal of ambiguity. If you look at the expression a plus b divided by c, you do have the question as to whether you're supposed to add a and b first and then divide by c, or whether you're supposed to divide b by c and then add the result to a. Now, in a programming language like Fortran, um, or I believe uh, C, there are rules for which operators will um, be done first. And the rule says you should do the division, absent parentheses or other indications. You should do the division first, and then the addition. So it will do all divisions and multiplications, and then it will do the addition. Um, but if you happen to forget that rule, um, uh, you you know, or you're just being careless and you mean for A and B to be added before dividing by C, you can uh, get that wrong. In Lisp, it's unambiguous. It's very clear what's being done. Um, uh, B is being divided by C because that's the internal form there, and 
then A is being added to the result. And as a result, list uh, programs can be parsed trivially, uh, which uh, means um, what I really want to say there is unambiguously, because it's not always easy to um, uh, read list code, but uh, it can only mean one thing is the point. The other LISP issue is that LISP is doing uh, memory management um, from your point of view generally in the background. That is, LISP has grabbed uh, memory from the operating system and is running using that memory. And when it has stored data, which it discovers is no longer necessary, um, uh, that data is freed up and the space it was taking is made available um, for new data that you might create. Now, um, the action of going through and seeing which data is no longer being used and um, discarding it is called garbage collection. And when LIST does a garbage collection, it actually, from your, the user's point of view, it actually stops the program. The program becomes unresponsive and it does its memory thing, and when it's completed, the program starts up again and becomes responsive again. Now, that may sound bad, but the point is the garbage collection is generally very fast, faster than a human can um, notice it. Uh, and so you don't really have to think that much about garbage collection, but there are some circumstances, some large, complicated programs where memory management becomes more of an issue and garbage collections become noticeable. And if garbage collection becomes noticeable, then you have to start thinking about why that's happening and you, there are various tools for improving it. But at the level we are, um, at, at the uh, beginning level, you're simply not going to run, in, uh, run into this um, problem. And because LIST does its memory management for you, um, you get much more efficient memory management. You tend not to uh, run out of space um, as uh, quickly or as often as you would in other programs where you have to do your own memory management. Now, let's start talking about LISP syntax. I've already mentioned prefix notation, where the function name is followed by um, zero or more arguments. Uh, list function calls are delimited by parentheses, and on the bottom of this slide are examples of three function calls. The first one, we are adding uh, three numbers, two, three, and four. Uh, the plus is, of course, the name of the addition function, uh, which is um, a, un un unsurprisingly, uh, what the name is. The second one, we're doing a multiplication. And notice that this is more complicated. We're not multiplying numbers. We're multiplying things which are themselves function calls which have to be um, uh, evaluated. So, uh, and we'll get to how things are evaluated in the order of evaluation shortly. In the third case, we're not dealing with numbers at all. Uh, we're telling the system to um, print the string, hello world, uh, and that's precisely what it would do. It would print it um, to the right below the prompt um, that <coughs> what that you type uh, the print statement to. Um, here are some more examples of list syntax. Um, in these cases, there are things that are not yet defined. There is no standard list function called solve polynomial. Um, so calling this first expression assumes that you have defined a function called solve polynomial that takes the four arguments in a particular, with a particular meaning. Um, the second, there is a Lisp um, operator called if, and it takes a test form and then one or two result forms. Um, the first result form says, if the test form is true, um, execute this result form. The second result form is, if the um, test form is false, um, execute the second result form. Only the first result form is needed. Um, 
And if uh, the test form is false and there's only one, the true result form, then it does nothing. And then finally, we have a standard loop. This is actually uh, standard LISPs. The functions turn on heat and turn on air conditioning don't um, uh, exist, just like salt polynomial. They have to be defined. But this um, uh, third function uh, here, do times, uh, is a standard common list um, uh, looping function. And let me just uh, demonstrate that last one in Lisp. Um, file on disk has become, uh, yeah, we'll just ignore that. And let me just show that last thing. So we did do times, which is a looping operator. And so that says, the name of the variable that we're going to use in our loop is i. And it's going to start at 0 and go up to, but not including, 5. Um, and I'll make a comment about that in just a second. And then print i. And we have to close off all the parentheses. And there we go. So there are a couple of important points about Lisp um, that are going to be mentioned uh, again and again, Lisp is zero-based. So with only one or two exceptions, the first element is the zeroth element. So when something starts, it starts when a loop here um, they, that is iterating over a number of times, the first value is zero. And then it goes up to, but not including, the last value. So we get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Notice that we are getting 5 times through the loop. There are 5 numbers printed there. But we start at 0, and we end at 4. We never get to 5. Um, so that's uh, one um, important uh, thing to remember about Lisp. Everything is zero-based. What if we, here is a list. Um, I've shown some examples of Lisp. There's one and, you know, red and green. Uh, I'll explain that quote later. Um, so there's a list and the, this, the, what we in English would call the first element of the list is the one that is index 0. This is index 1, and the string green is index 2. Um, so you just have to remember that Lisp is zero-based. You get used to that after a while if you're not used to things being zero-based. So um, I just uh, been showing you lists that I've been typing in, and lists are used source code of, of a Lisp is a collection of lists uh, delimited by parentheses. And the def function definitions are lists. And to define a function, you use the operator named defun, uh, which is um, kind of an abbreviation for define function. And to define a function, you do open parentheses, the word defun, then the name of the function, then a list of arguments, with each argument being given a name, and then the code uh, that um, you want to, you want you the code that does what you want the function to do. So we have a very simple function here called my square. It takes an argument and it multiplies the argument by itself and returns the value. Once you have defined that, you can call my square with an appropriate argument, which has to be a number, um, because numbers are the only things you can multiply. And so when you give it a number, like the number 7 that we have done there, um, the result is returned. And the result in this case is, of course, 49. Um, now, uh, list every object in list is an object of a particular type, and Lisp has a large number of built-in types, and you can 
define new types um, on your own. And so it lists, has a large and ex extensible number of types of objects. And <coughs> here are some examples. Um, first, we have uh, types that exist in virtually any programming language, um, including numbers and strings. Now, in Lisp, you can have integers. You can have floating point numbers. So we have the integer, uh, 123. We have the floating point number, 1.45. We can express floating point numbers in different ways by using uh, exponential notation, uh, which is uh, fairly standard across most computer languages. Um, Lisp also supports, as well as integers, it supports ratios. So 3 slash 5 is the fraction 3 fifths. It is not the floating point number 0.6. It is equal to, it has the same value as that, but it is represented actually as the ratio of two integers. And this becomes important because um, uh, integer arithmetic is exact, while floating point arithmetic is approximate. And as long as you're sticking with integers and ratios, um, you're actually getting exact computations. Um, after a while, they don't become particularly readable, but um, you are storing the exact numbers. But this is, you know, you either want to do that or not, depending on your requirements. But the point here is that list supports uh, ratios as a type of number, something which many other languages don't. And the final example there where it's hash C, that's a complex number, um, and it's uh, the real part is the integer 2, and the imaginary part is the integer 3. Another data type found in almost every language is a string, again, delimited by double quotes, and we actually got it to use the straight quotes in this case. Um, and so there's the string. It contains those characters. This is a fine day. Um, now, some other data types which are exist in uh, Lisp only or in, 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 in just a few other programming languages, there's the notion of a symbol. A symbol is a um, basically a name, or symbols uh, name objects within Lisp. In particular, they name variables and functions. Another data type which is supported in Lisp are lists. And we've shown examples of lists. Uh, and I just wanted to show this example. Notice that we have a list of three elements. It may look like there are four, but there are only three elements to the top level list. The symbol A, and then a list. The second element is itself a list a list containing the symbols B and C. And then the third element of the top level list is the symbol D. And you can have uh, lists within lists, and you can even have circular lists that contain references to themselves. But we're not mentioning those uh, further in this elementary course, but there are reasons for having those. Another data type is a character. A character is an element of a string. So this string up uh, above, this is a fine day, is made up of the characters, capital T, lowercase h, lowercase i, lowercase s, space, and so on. Uh, but a character is a distinct uh, data type within Lisp. Um, there are plenty of other data types. And in particular, there are arrays. Arrays are very common to uh, many programming languages and are fully supported within Lisp. And there are more complex data types like hash tables. Um, and we're going to get to many of these other data types later, uh, not today, but in uh, the subsequent lectures. Now, I mentioned the garbage collector. And program data is freed automatically when there are no more references to it. So when an object is uh, the system discovers an object is not referenced. It disposes of it and makes the space it was occupying available for new data. Um, 
Generally, as I said, particularly when you're starting out, you don't have to worry about this. It's done automatically in the background. And, um, and even though at the time of the garbage collection, the system stops, um, the garbage collection itself, the process is so fast that it occurs more quickly than humans can notice. Um, just as an aside, um, you know, if the garbage collection is taking a hundredth of a second, that is less time than humans can notice, but it's not less time than other computers can notice. So um, if you have computers communicating with one another and one of them is running a list program, the other one has to expect there are going to be uh, brief moments when it's not communicating um, because it is garbage collecting. And it's got to, uh, um, the other program uh, has to not um, worry about that fact. It has to learn to deal with it. When you do things in LISP, the, the action that you're taking is called evaluation. And basically, the way LISP runs is it reads the command, it evaluates the command, and it prints the result. That is called the read, eval, print loop. And let me just go back to the LISP here. And so here is the command, adding 1 and 2. So I have typed it in. When I'm about to hit the return button, when I hit the return button, the system reads what I have typed in and evaluates it. Evaluates it means um, do the calculation. In this case, it looks at the first thing and says, OK, it wants me to add something. And then it um, says, oh, it wants me to add 1 and 2. And then the result of that is, of course, 3. And the third step is to print the result. And it printed the number 3, which you see just below there. So the basic process of LISP is it reads a command, it evaluates the command, it prints the result. Now, the things I can type to the prompt here are all very simple commands. Um, of course, a complicated LISP program. And LISP itself, the thing you see running there, is itself a LISP program. Um, uh, you know, uh, are much more complicated and uh, much more powerful than the simple things I've been typing. Um, so whatever you type, you can, uh, there are three types of objects you can type in. You can type in a symbol, and in that case, it's interpreted as naming a variable, and what the evaluation is to find the value of that variable. And then the print operation is to print the value of that variable. You can type in a list, um, which is uh, what we've mostly been doing. Um, and the first element of that list uh, must name an operator. Uh, and the remaining elements specify the arguments. And it will then apply the operator to those arguments and print the result. And the third thing you can type in is some other kind of Lisp object. And basically, all other Lisp kinds of Lisp objects are self-evaluating. Um, so let me just, um, so I haven't uh, defined any symbols, but there are some symbols with predefined values. And one of them is print level. And I'm guessing it's nil, yes, the value of it. So print level is a standard common list variable. Uh, it's a symbol naming the variable star print hyphen level star. And when I type it in, its value is retrieved and printed out. And the value in this case is the symbol nil. Um, again, when I type in a list, there's the operator. Here are the arguments, 1 and 2. And if I type in something else, such as a number, a number just evaluates to itself. Um, and 3 fifths, the one I, I, I mentioned as a ratio, prints out as 3 fifths, 1.3333666. See how that does. Um, I just wanted to show you something here. I've typed in the floating point number, one point, lots of threes, and then lots of sixes. 
And notice that it didn't print back exactly what I typed in. This is a feature of floating point numbers. And what's happening is the reader is reading this. Now, floating point numbers on this machine, which is a 32-bit machine, are stored in 32 bits, of which one is the sign bit, and then there are seven, I think, that are used for um, the exponent, and 24, uh, effectively 24, that are used. Maybe it's eight for the exponent, and effectively 24 uh, that are used, but only 23 represented for the value. And in 23 or 24 bits, you can get sort of eight or seven, eight, nine digits. And so how many have we got here? We've actually got eight digits. Um, and so I typed in a lot more than eight digits there. And it read it in. And it found the floating point number represented 32 bits, which most closely re um, uh, was most close in some definition of most close, but anyway, very close to what I typed in. And then that is the floating point number that it printed back. And so when you're typing in, you see, when we typed in 3 fifths, um, it actually returned exactly what we typed in, as it did with 2. But with floating point numbers, it converts them to the machine representation and the machine representation is used from then on. It has no memory whatsoever of exactly what you typed in, just of the machine representation that was read, as, that was created as a result of reading what you typed in. Um, that's an issue that will come up for people. It's um, the same issue exists in every programming language. Um, but you know, I always remind people to remember it. Floating point arithmetic is not exact. Um, so self-evaluating objects or numbers, strings, and in fact, everything else, which is what those three dots do. Everything self every object self-evaluates within looks. Um, if it, except for symbols, which you evaluate to their value as a variable, and lists, where the first element of the list is taken to be the name of an operator and the remaining elements specifying the arguments. So. The basic thing, I mean, it's not very interesting to evaluate numbers, because you know what the numbers are. Um, you're typing them in. And it's only somewhat more interesting to evaluate variables, because again, you know what they are. What's interesting in LISP is to evaluate function calls, because that's actually going to do some work. And you, a function call is represented as a list. What you type in is a list. And when the evaluator sees a list, it um, takes the first element, and it is assumed to be the name of the function. And then all the rest of the elements are evaluated in the order in which they appear in the list. And the result of such evaluation is passed to the function named by the first element as um, as arguments, I, the syntax of this sentence is each uh, element of the list after the first one is evaluated, and that result of that evaluation is passed to the function as an argument, and it proceeds down until it runs out of arguments to pass. So when we're using the addition function, and it's the reader will read this, and it will read the first element and say, ah, plus the addition function. And then it will look at the subsequent arguments, and it will say 2, a number, evaluates to itself. So the first argument is 2, and the second argument is 3, and the third argument is 4. So what I'm supposed to do is add those three numbers. And um, so that's what it does, and it gets the result 9. Notice that plus is not a binary operator. It doesn't work just on two values. It, in fact, works on any number of values. Um, there is some limit on the number of arguments you can have, which is in the thousands. Um, and in all the years I've been programming in Lisp, I've never uh, run into that limit, so I don't remember what it is. Um, but uh, up to that limit, you can 
put as many arguments as you want to plus and to a variety of other uh, arithmetic functions. So what happens, let's get back to um, a more complicated example. Um, so we've got the uh, symbol which names the function. And then the subsequent things don't themselves just have to be numbers in this case. They can themselves be expressions which have to be evaluated. By the way, an expression uh, like um, shown here, a function call shown here, the uh, typical name for that in Lisp is a form. And so a form is something suitable to be evaluated and often um, so this whole thing is a form with the star, and, and these things within are also forms. Technically, two is a form as well, but form is often used for one of these function call expressions. Uh, and you will hear me use it because um, it's uh, the, the term used, and I just use it automatically. So here we have a multiplication, and then the next thing is itself a function call the function minus with two arguments, and the result. So that expression is evaluated. So it's identified star as the function multiplication, the multiplication function. Then it goes to the next element of the list and said, ah, this is itself a list, so I have to evaluate it. And it identifies the subtraction function, and then the two arguments, 7 and 1. And this means take the first, argu the first argument after the subtraction function name, and then subtract all the remaining arguments from it. And in this case, there's only one remaining argument, so 7 minus 1 is 6. So the first argument actually passed to the function star is 6. An important point is by the time you reach the function star, it only sees 6. It has no idea that the call was made with another expression which had to be evaluated. It just sees 6. This isn't particularly important in this arithmetic function, but it does become important in other cases. In particular, it doesn't know that the function minus was called. Uh, and when you're writing your own function, sometimes you want it to know that what functions were called, but you have to remember it has, doesn't have that information um, by the time you get to the outer function call here. So anyway, let's see, minus 7, 1 is 6, and we're multiplying, this is 2. So we're multiplying 6 times 2 times 2, the result is 24. Um, and you can just, you've got a prompt, and you can um, uh, type in forms as, uh, these two examples, and it will um, give you the result. And um, uh, so if you're programming Lisp and you have a Lisp running, uh, you don't actually need a calculator. If anybody asks you to do a quick calculation, um, you can just uh, um, you can just type it in as a Lisp form and um, there you go. It just does the calculation for you. And one finds oneself actually doing that quite a lot. You just have Lisp running on your computer, and when you need to do a calculation, you just type it into Lisp rather than trying to find where your calculator is or using those very tiresome calculators on uh, computers where you have to point and click and so on, if you're any good at typing. So um, let's go on. The symbols, as I've already said, are things uh, that provide names. They name variables, and they also name functions. And the same symbol can name both a variable and a function. They don't affect one another. And symbols also have additional information associated with them, which we're not going to go in at this time. Basically, symbols. Um, for our purposes at this point of the um, course are just names of variables and functions. And you, there's no restrictions on the symbol names at all. Um, in Fortran, or at least it used to be when I was programming, 
programming in it many years ago. Uh, function uh, um, uh, na uh, variable names that began with um, I forget I J K L M N something like that had to be integers, and the other ones had to be floating point numbers. Maybe that changed later. Um, in Lisp, there are no such restrictions, and also the same symbol can name a function and name a variable, um, and the fact that it's named both a function and a variable don't interfere with one another at all. So the symbols have a what is called a print representation. So when the system prints out the name of the symbol, it prints it using its print representation, and typically symbol names consist of a number of consecutively displayed characters, usually letters and numbers, and hyphens, sometimes stars, often stars on the outside the first and the last characters. But in fact, almost all the characters are legal, except there are some special characters which you shouldn't use in symbol names. Um, and uh, in particular, um, parentheses you don't use, and um, backslashes, which are escape characters, and a few others. But everything else is uh, pretty much available. So, you know, we can name a symbol um, star dollar sign percent. Um, and if I actually do this, I'm going to get an error. So I'm actually going to, um, we'll come to this function or this operator later. What I'm doing is saying set the variable value of the symbol named a star dollar sign percent to 10. And if I want to retrieve that value, it's a star, what is it, dollar sign, uh, whoops, dollar sign percent. And yep, there it's IU10. Um, but more typically, you give things names that are you know, actually useful and memorable. Um, and in this uh, programming example we had, you notice that we have symbols. The name of the function is compute list of occurrences and print data. In other words, these are examples of giving uh, function names uh, that are actually meaningful in English. The argument name here is list of counts or string of digits, whatever. Um, so some people like to use names for symbols that are meaningful in English. I personally like using as few letters as possible, but that makes my code a little less readable. Um, and that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, what was I doing? Alt tab. There we go. Um, now, within the system in ANSI common list, the alphabetic characters of a symbol name are typically upcased. And we're running an ANSI list here, and that means that if I define the symbol, um, let me get back to the debug window here, if I define the symbol A, A B, C, D, it's actually stored and remembered in all caps. And it took those lowercase characters and it converted them to uppercase characters. And that is just standard um, common list. Uh, and so generally, uh, characters are uppercase. And that's generally done automatically. And we're not really going to go into um, ways to um, avoid that in an ANSI list. Therefore, ANSI list is case insensitive, and the symbols spelled in the three ways, the symbol red, you can type it in all lowercase with some capital letters and some lowercase letters, or all uppercase, and they're all red and converted to be the same symbol. Um, conventionally, list code is entered in lowercase, and um, when you read, that was the case in our example here. Um, every uh, We type this whole thing in lowercase. The only uppercase, um, eh, hardly any uppercase to be seen, but sometimes it appears in strings or things you want to print. Um, or uh, So 
but the um, so you type it in lowercase, but because we're running an ANSI list, all these symbol names such as print data and um, uh, compute list of occurrences and so on are converted so that if we uh, searched for symbol names, um, uh, which we can do with the apropos function, and we um, let's just give it uh, so count do. Um, so you notice that here's our our um, function that we define count digits of factorial. This thing I type here is also a symbol in the keyword package. We'll get to that later. It's called count D, even though I typed it in in lowercase. And there's some internal symbol which is, shouldn't concern you, but happens to have the letters C O U N T hyphen D um, in it. So. It, it, it got um, captured as well. Um, in Allegro CL, we actually have two versions of lists, what we call the ANSI list, which I've been running. And that is a standard common list where symbol names are upcased when you type them in. And we have what we call the modern common list. And that's uh, case sensitive. And symbol names are typically in lowercase. Um, I just happened to be running the ANSI common list so that um, you saw uh, next time I can run this, the modern one so you can see how that works too. Um, either uh, you can work in either mode, um, uh, and most everything works just as well either way that you do it. So when you type a symbol into the um, at a prompt, it evaluates the symbol by looking for the value of the symbol that is the system has uh, stored. If you, the symbol has not been given a value, then you'll get an error when you type it in. And we'll demonstrate that shortly. If we assume uh, that the symbol's number of apples, the number of bananas have been given values, which are integers, we could evaluate the form plus number of apples, numbers of bananas. The symbol pi, pi, is a predefined common list symbol whose value is a double float representation of the value of pi, 3.14, et cetera. Um, internal time units per second is also a predefined common list uh, symbol that is uh, telling you something about um, your machine. Let me just show both of these. Um, so here's pi. And you see it's a double float. And here is internal ti. Let me see if I can complete that. Up oh, there we go. Internal time units per second, and it's a thousand. Uh, now, so you're thinking to yourself, what? I'm just going to give you a quick demonstration of um, the documentation. This is a standard common list symbol, and you're thinking. Yeah, but what, what is it representing? If you put the cursor on it, and I've put it at the end, but anywhere within the symbol, and you press the F1 button on, this is on Windows only, um, but when you're running the IDE like this, um, it comes up uh, after a couple of seconds with the documentation. This is the standard common list documentation, uh, the ANSI um, standard, which is an ANSI document defining common list. And internal time units per second is defined on this page. It says it's a magnitude, which is implementation dependent. Um, but whatever, however you've defined an internal time unit, it's the number of them in one second. Let me show you a couple of other things about the documentation, just as a, a side here. First of all, it's being shown in the IDE here in a browser which is local to the IDE. That is, we're not running a Mozilla or Chrome. We're running a widget which is within Lisp, so that when we minimize Lisp, it gets minimized too. So uh, there's also on, our docu uh, on a, the documentation a bar up here with links to various standard documents. So there's the table of contents. And uh, it's just a standard table of contents that lists the various documents. And 
um, gives you a you know link to the various chapters in the document. There we go. Um, going back up to the top here, um, we also have a overview document that simply is an introduction to the documentation. We have an introduction to our common graphics integrated development environment. What you see running is the integrated development environment. Here's the release notes for Allegro CL 8.2. Um, here, uh, this actually is going to take us out of LISP and into a browser somewhere. But we're actually uh, accessing the internet. And here are um, a couple of um, facts, frequently asked questions. And now, there's a standard index. And the standard index sort of lists all functions. So here are various functions, mailbox. There's a mailbox um, um, utility within LISP. And here are a bunch of mailbox functions here. Um, but also has topics like the main program, see the document main.htm. And let's see if we can see more topics here. Sometimes they're longer uh, expressions, which I'm Oh, yes, mandatory style, conditional new line in ANSI spec kind of thing. And one other kind of index is the permuted index. And let's say you were trying to remember the name of that variable we just typed, which was internal time units per second. You couldn't remember that it started with internal. Uh, you just couldn't remember the first name. But you knew that it had time units in it somewhere. If you go look at the permuted index, and we're looking for time units, and so you notice the keys are all appearing in the middle with text to the left of them and to the right of them. And we scroll down um, quite a ways until we get to around time. And we remembered it was time units. And you do eventually find internal time units per second down there. And so if you have a name or you think of words, but you're not sure they're going to be the beginning, and so you're not sure which page of the index to look in, you can look in the um, permuted index. One uh, annoying um, detail of our internal uh, documentation when it's running in this special IDE window, which has many advantages, is that there's no search facility. So if you type Control-F, it says, no string search, sorry. Um, if you were running this in a regular browser, you typically would have uh, the ability to search for something. So um, I was talking about evaluating symbols. Uh, there are two special symbols, T and nil, um, representing true and false. Um, the variables named by these symbols always evaluate to themselves. T evaluates the T. Nil evaluates the nil. You can't set the value of T to anything other than itself. You can't set it at all. So the form that would try to set it to have value 100 um, fails. Um, that's not such a big deal with nil, because we don't usually use nil. But you know, sometimes you want to use T as a variable, and you aren't thinking. And you uh, do that, and then you get an error when you try to run the code. And that's why. These are um, special uh, symbols representing uh, true and false. And you will see them being used in our example codes. If the first character that you're typing in is a quote, and again, um, we're getting a Microsoft's editor saying, I'm giving you a curly quote rather than a, uh, a straight quote, which is what we're trying to do, but you just have to imagine a straight quote. Um, if the first character of anything to be evaluated is a quote, the thing that follows is um, returned unchanged. So the symbol A is not the same as quote A, and the list ABC is not the same as quote ABC. And let me just. Um, yeah, that's not what I wanted. So let's go back there and one, two. There we go. Um, so we have defined the symbol a um, star dollar sign percent. If I type that in, it's evaluated. Its value is ten. If I type quote 
a star dollar sign percent. That's saying I'm interested in the thing following that quote, that single quote, and so I get back the symbol a star dollar sign percent. Notice it upcase the A because it's an ANSI list. If I type in the list one plus one two, it evaluates it, treats plus as a function name, and comes up with the result three. If I do quote plus one two, it says, ah, you're interested in the literal list whose first element is the symbol plus, whose second element is the number one, whose third element is the number two, and I will simply return that list. So um, you use symbols as variables. So we could have an expression if EQ is an equality test. Here's a variable called today, which presumably has a value, which is a symbol naming a day. And it's saying, if the value of today is the symbol Monday, and then do something. We don't have the rest of the form. Or we could uh, create a list whose first element is July, whose second element is the result of evaluating this form, i.e. 4 and whose third element is the value of the symbol this year. This is a variable. We will take the value of that. July, it's not looking at the value. It's looking at the symbol itself. So this will result, assuming this year is the um, number 2010, 2010, this will result in the list July 4, 2010. And again, Here's the find function, a standard common list function. It's searching for the symbol meat in what's presumably a list of ingredients to a recipe. And it's asking whether meat is one of the ingredients. So you, a symbol is created when the list reader reads the appropriate sequence of characters. Um, so in, it, it was reading our source code, and it created all those symbols um, that were referenced in it. Some of them already existed. Let's just go look quickly. Um, so here was our source code. And so when it first read this, let's see, that's commented out. So let's just go up to the top. And it saw defund. And it said, oh, that's a common list symbol. I uh, know what it is. And it's already defined. And then it saw count digits of factorial. And the first time it read this, it said, hmm, that symbol doesn't exist. I will now create it. And so it creates a symbol with no value and no function definition. By the time it's completed it doing this defund form, then count digits of factorial will have a function definition, still doesn't have a value. Then it continued reading, and it said positive integer arg. That symbol doesn't exist, so I have to create it. If, or, and not a standard common list symbols. Integer P is a standard common list symbol. Here's the second occurrence of this. So this symbol already exists. So it reads it. It knows about it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when you're creating a variable, you want to create a um, variables are created in various ways. But you typically create global variables with expressions def bar, def parameter, and def constant. Most things for creating objects in lists start with def um, for not for creating the object, but for creating the definition of the object. Start with def um, and followed by something representing. So def bar is you're creating a variable. Def parameter, you're creating a parameter. Def constant, you're creating a constant. We're not going to talk much about constants, and we're going to get to the difference between a variable and a parameter very shortly. Or you create a local variable with forms such as let and let star, which we're going to discuss shortly. So there is a notion of a global or special variable, and those are created with def var and def parameter. Def var, the form of a def var is 
the symbol def var, open parentheses, the symbol def var, the symbol name, no quotes or anything, just the symbol name, and in this case, star, A-L-P-H-A star, and then optionally for def var, a value. Um, and uh, if you don't specify a value, then this thing does not yet have a value. It's You've told the system, expect this to be a global variable, and if you give it a value, it will be a value of the global variable, but we haven't given it a value yet. In the, we've also defined the variable star beta star, which we've given the value 6. It's going to evaluate this expression, and times 2 and 3 is 6. And we've defined the parameter gamma, which we've given the value 14. Now, notice that all these symbols naming these global variables are um, of the form star, then a name, and then star. And that is simply a convention. Most global variables are um, named with stars on, you know, starting with the star and ending with the star. And that just makes them very easy to see in your source code that you're referring to a global variable. If you use that convention consistently, you can always tell what's a global variable and what's not. But there's no requirement. This is just a convention. So remember, we've not given alpha a value. We've given beta the value 6 with a def var form. And we've given gamma the value 14 with a def parameter form. If we now try to evaluate alpha, we get an error. It says the alpha, that symbol, does not have a value. Um, a symbol, when a symbol does not have a value and you try to evaluate it, you get an unbound variable error, which is what's demonstrated here. Pop colon POP says get out of the debugger. Um, we know what the problem is. But we can evaluate beta, the value 6, and we can evaluate gamma with the value 14. Now, let's uh, go back and we're going to evaluate these def, we're going to evaluate new def var forms. First of all, we're going to do alpha again and give it the value 3. We're going to do beta and give it the value 5. Remember, its previous value was 6. And we're going to do gamma and give it the value 7. Its previous value was 14. Now, when we alf evaluate alpha, we get 3. That was the value we just gave it. When we evaluate beta, we get 6. That was the original value. The new value that we just gave it there is ignored. Um, but when we evaluate gamma, we get the new value 7 instead of the old value 14. And that's the difference between def var and def parameter. The first time that def var is specified and gives the value is the only time the def var will set that variable, variable to a value. Any subsequent def var that is seen is ignored. And the value of the variable is not changed by seeing that def var form. In contrast, def parameter, every time you see a def parameter, the value specified, the value of the variable is changed to the new value specified. And the fact of the matter is you might want to do one of those things or you might want to do um, the other. Um, suppose that you have a um, program which is uh, adding members to a membership list and um, you have different, you know, one bit of your program is analyzing incoming email, and one bit of your program is uh, being typed in and analyzing um, incoming um, uh, letters. Somebody's sitting there typing in the results of letters. You want both bits of the programs, when they start up, to set the number of members. You have a variable, star, number, hyphen, of, hyphen, members, star. And you want, whichever the program starts up, the email evaluator uh, processor or the regular mail processor, to start with the number of, ma of uh, existing members. And then each one will um, add, you know, each time a new membership is processed, it will add to that number. 
But if you start up the email processing and, and initialize that to the number of members, and then later you start up the um, uh, regular letter processing, you don't want it, the regular letter processing to overwrite the memberships that have been added by the email processor. So you would use def var. And there are reasons for using def parameter. But the important thing is that def var and def parameter are identical in every respect except only one def var valuation is ever paid attention to, the first one seen, and every def parameter um, uh, specification is seen. So how are we doing here? We shall move. Uh, we have about half an hour, and we'll move through. Most of LISP, when you're particularly coming from certain other programming traditions like Fortran, you think entirely in terms of global variables. You sort of define lots of global variables and um, give them values, and sort of your functions are operating on global variables. But better LISP programming actually um, uses very few global variables. and uh, uses mostly local variables within functions. They only have values within the function. Uh, so here's a form that says let star, and it said create the variables x, y, and z, and give the variable x the value 0, the variable y the value 6, and the variable z, which has no value specified, so it's simply given the value nil. It's not like def bar not given any value, it's actually given the value nil. And so we say print out the value of z, and then this format statement is essentially saying print out the value of x and y. And so here's what it does. It prints nil, which is the value of z. It prints a list of 0 and 6, which are the values of x and y. And then the value of the entire form is what format itself returned, and format itself typically returns nil. So this final nil is the value of the entire form. Remember, the formula is read the form, evaluate the form, and part of the evaluation were several print statements, and then print the return value of the form, and that's that final nil there. That's where it's coming from. Uh, there's both let and let star, and the difference is that let star allows you, when defining later local variables, to use values of earlier local variables, while let, everything is done in parallel, so you can't specify y in terms of x. Generally, people use let star all the time unless there's a reason to use let. Um, the Notion, when a variable is given a value, the variable is said to be bound. The binding is changed by um, operators set Q or set F, and two variables um, can have the same name. So here's a complicated piece of code where we have let, and we're saying let the variable A be 1, and then we're going to add the value of A to the result of this inner form. And in this inner form, we're, again, a let statement, and the value we're letting, the value of a be 10. So in this inner inner expression here, a is 10. That was the local value here. We add 1 to it to get 11. Then we add that to the outer value of a, which is 1, and the final result is 12. Even though we're using the same, this is very bad programming style, but it's perfectly legal programming. Now, there's a very important point, which we're going to demonstrate, and it takes a little while to kind of get used to this. There are two kinds of variables, static variables, which are local, and the references can only be made within a program construct in which it is given a value, created or bound, and a special or dynamic variable, which is global, and where references are meaningful at any time. So here is an example. We're defining a function gamma. It takes a single argument v, and it binds the local variable w to the value 7. And then we print v, and we print w, and then we call another function delta with the argument, the sum of 
v and w, the sum of the argument to gamma plus 7. Now down here in delta, it takes an argument, which is called delta arg, and we print it out. And then we say, let's print w and v. And both of those will fail. If we tried to evaluate this, we get an error that said w does not have a value. Because even though w does have a value in the calling function gamma, the fact these bindings are not transferred down to the called function delta. They are just local to gamma and can't be seen by functions called by gamma. Now, you're saying, well, what about print? We're passing, but we're not passing the variable v to print. We're passing the value of v to print. So print doesn't see the symbol v. It sees the value of the symbol v. Down here, we're asking delta to give us information about the symbol v. And it knows nothing about it. And so it can't do it, and it signals an error. We could create a global or special variable, and that would allow us to do this. So the action of calling def var defines a special variable. And we define the special variable. And since it's a special variable, we call it star v star instead of v. And we give it the value 3. And star w star, and we get the value 19. And now we define gamma almost um, exactly the same. But we're giving it the argument star v star. And when we call gamma with a value, say 20, it won't see the 3, which is its true global value. It will see the local value specified in the function call. Similarly, it won't see 19, which is the global value of star w star. It will see 7, which is the local binding created by this let form. So when it prints star v star, it will print whatever you passed as an argument. When it prints star w star, it will print 7. And now it's going to call delta. Let's say you pass 20 as an argument. It's going to call delta with the value 27. Now we go down here to delta. And it's going to um, uh, print um, those uh, values. So let's, um, uh, let's, let's actually go evaluate these so you can see what's going on here. Um, I did, did I, let's see if I to find these. I might have done. Ah, nope, that's um, a different thing. I thought I uh, defined these, but we'll just do them quickly. Um, so what are we doing? Star V star, what was that? I don't care. Uh, 3 and def star W star 10 and define gamma, and it takes the list of star v star. And notice, by the way, the cursor is indenting to make the code easier to read. Um, star w star 7, I believe. Doesn't matter. And so then we said print star v star, print star w star, and call delta with um, plus star v star, star w star. So that's our function gamma. And we're going to define delta. And it just takes a single argument. And um, let me just go back. Remember what it did. And it prints the argument, and then it prints uh, star v star and star w star. Um, let's do that. So, so we print the argument, and we print star v star. Oops. V star. There we go. So if we call gamma with 1 as the value, oh, what it, oh, of course, if I learned to type, I'd be in much better shape here. Gamma 1. And 
what did I do? Aha. Uh -huh. I so let us um, there's a clever way to do this in the IDE, which is you do that. What I forgot here was this parenthesis and this parenthesis. So I've redefined gamma. Um, and uh, by the way, you just saw a couple of examples of you know typing mistakes can call, cause errors. Um, so let's try this again. So we're doing gamma of one. So it's printing. What's gamma doing? It's printing v, which is the argument one. It's printing star w star, which is seven, and it's calling delta with the value eight, and then delta um, prints eight and it prints 1 and 7. Notice 1 and 7 and not the global values. I'll show you that in a second. And gamma, um, let's see, where is gamma here? Gamma, the last form in gamma is calling delta. And so the final value here is the result of calling gamma, which is the result of calling delta. So it repeats that 7. Notice, by the way, that delta can be called on its own. And this time, it prints its argument, which is 2. And then it prints w. And since it isn't being called from gamma, it's seeing the global value of, um, I should scroll up to where we can actually see that. Um, it's printing star v star. And that's the global value of star v star, which is 3. And then it's printing star w star. And it's the global value. When it's called from gamma, it prints the values that are local within gamma. But when it's just called by itself, it sees the actual global values. So um, it takes a little work to get this stuff straight, but um, eventually you figure it out and you notice the difference between local values, what values get passed down, what values don't. Um, and here's a more complicated example where you know the, the, the thing is going to load a file. And we uh, have a default file global variable, which we don't give a value to, and a default directory local variable, which we do give a value to, but which I just noticed we neglected to put the second star on. should have a star after the y. I'll correct that in the slides. Um, and the important thing is that you have to do this with process file, because you're specifying a value for default file. If you just call loader by itself, default file won't have a value and you get an error. OK, we've been talking all about functions. There are some other kinds of operators within list. There are macros, and there are what are called special operators. There are very few special operators, and you can't define one yourself. You can define your own macros. And so when the reader is processing a list, remember the first element has to name an operator. Up to this point, it's been naming functions. But it can also name a macro or a special operator. And when it determines that it's naming a macro or a special operator, what it does with the remaining elements of the list depends on the defined behavior of the macro or the special operator. When the first element is a function, it always evaluates the remaining elements of the list and passes those values to the named function. But macros and special operators are different. And um, we're uh, not going to go into them in detail. We're going to tell you about some macros and special operators. Set Q is a special operator which sets the value of a variable. So set Q. In the form, we have an example form here. The first argument to set Q must be a symbol. And the second argument must evaluate to the desired value. Notice that when you call this, the symbol is not going to be evaluated. Um, but the value portion is going to be evaluated. For the purpose of giving a value to a symbol of variable, set F is equivalent to set Q. But set F has other purposes, which we will get to later, but we're not going to mention now. For the purposes of setting variable values, set F and set Q are the same thing. Um, the second element of the list, that is the variable name, is not evaluated. The third element of the list is evaluated. 
So we say set to x to 35.0, and the description of what's happening is the variable being set is named by the symbol x. Now, in list, variables are not typed. You can declare variables to tell the compiler this variable is going to have a value of this type, but that's only for information to the compiler. The variable itself doesn't have any kind of label associated with it that is saying my value is an integer or my value is a string. Variables can have any values, but the objects which are their values are typed. There are no type restrictions to the value of the variables. X can be an integer, it can be a float, it can be a string. The value can be any Lisp object, but every Lisp object has a particular type. Um, again, uh, the um, just an ANSI Lisp, which is what we're running, symbol names are upcased, um, and so all of these three expressions are identical. They're all setting the value of the symbol color, all caps, C-O-L-O-R, to the symbol red, all caps, R-E-D. By the way, the annoying um, Microsoft uh, editor has changed this to the other kind of quotation, which is called a back quote. Um, and that works perfectly well, but back quotes also have a special meaning when defining macros. Um, uh, and I don't think we do macros in the elementary course, so we won't get to it, but back quotes and forward quotes work the same. Uh, where, where you use a back quote, you have a forward quote, a regular quote, you can also use the other one. What Microsoft did is it's all, oh, you have an opening quotation, single quotation, you must mean that one, and it's just too difficult to change in Microsoft programs. Okay, function definitions. Um, Function definitions are forms that start with defun. The next element defun is a macro. The next element is not evaluated, is a symbol, which is not evaluated. Then there is a list, which is not evaluated, specifying the arguments. And um, then there's the body of the function that tells you what to do. Here's the function my square takes a single argument, which in fact should be a number, but you haven't said anything. It's just if you give anything other than a number to star, it will complain. And what it does is it takes the argument and multiplies it by itself. So my square of 7 is 49. Here's another function called board dimensions. A semicolon starts a um, comment in list. So the reader will read defund board dimension, see the semicolon, and read nothing else on the line. The argument list is a list of two symbols. Arguments are always symbols, length and width. And the body says take length and multiply it by width. Here's, so once it's defined, if you take board dimensions of 12 times 14, you get the product of 12 and 14, uh, which is 168. Um, you can have the two arguments to this, length and width, are both required. If you called board dimension with only one argument, you'd get an error saying board dimension needs two arguments, exactly. But you can also define optional arguments, which you are free to specify or not. A optional argument is specified here. Length, width are called the required arguments, and extra is the optional argument. I'll say why it's in parentheses and what the zero means shortly. Um, and this says, add extra to both length and to width, and then multiply those two values together. So uh, the zero there is specifying the default value. If a value is not specified as the third argument, it's given the value zero. So 10, 12, 1 means 11 times 13, um, which is, what, 143. Um, 10, 12 extra has value 0, means 10 times 12, or 120. Um, there's also what are called keyword arguments, and that's specified this way. Here are the required arguments, length and width, and then 
the symbol, just like the optional argument, used the symbol ampersand optional. The keyword argument uses the symbol ampersand key. And then we're defining two keyword arguments, extra width and extra length. And we add extra length to length and extra width to width. And now notice that we can, def we can specify by giving it its name with this colon before it, meaning it's a keyword, we can specify only one of the two arguments and leave the other one to go to its default. This means that you can have lots of arguments which you don't have to specify, but um, uh, you can tell the system exactly which ones you're specifying and which ones should just use uh, their default values. There's also what are called REST arguments, which uh, mean when you get to a REST argument, um, so we have the two required arguments, length and width, and then a REST argument, and the result is you can specify any number of arguments. They are, all the additional arguments are put into a list, and that list is made the value of the REST argument name. So when we call board dimensions with um, 8 and 12 as length and width, and then Donald, Louie, and Dewey as the rest arguments. It will print the list. I mean, the value of who is to do the work is the list, Donald, Louie, Dewey, and length and width multiplied together will give you, um, what's that? Uh, 8 times uh, 12, 80, 96. Okay. Here are some details about optional and keyword arguments. You can specify them just as a symbol, in which case the default value is nil, as a list of a symbol and a default value, and that's what we did here. Extra width had the default value of zero, extra length also. Or here, extra had the default value zero. Um, the list uh, of a symbol and the default value, as we just showed, or a third thing, which is the list of the symbol, the default value, and another symbol. And then that value of that third, of that second symbol, is going to be nil if the optional or keyword argument was not specified, and t if it was specified. This allows you to tell the difference but when the keyword or optional argument has the default value, it allows you to tell the difference between the default value being specified and no value being specified. And we see this in this slightly complicated um, function here. So the function takes the argument previous value, balance, additional funds, and then the optional argument report, whose default value is nil, and the symbol report hyphen p will be true if the value of report is specified, whatever it is, and will be nil if the value of report is not specified, and therefore uses the default value nil. And the difference is indicated here, where it says uh, down below on the, what is it, fifth line, when it says, when report P, print out the statement, accounting as requested that we, and then either say do not issue or issue a report. Um, and uh, function definition, lambda list keywords, there's and optional, and key, and rest. It's legal but inadvisable to use both and optional and key. And optional will go first in that case, but don't do it. Keyword arguments act as um, optional arguments. You can use both and key and and rest, but um, we're not going to go into that now. It's a little complicated, um, and uh, it's it's not really at the elementary programming level. Okay, um, we're uh, near the end. We have ten more minutes. Uh, internally, Lisp um, refers to most objects via pointers. Um, we're looking just briefly at data quality. We'll go into it in more detail in the next lecture. But fundamentally, two objects are EQ, or EQ is the pronunciation, if they 
point to the same object in memory. And the test for two objects being EQ is very efficient. There's also an equality test EQL. And it's um, uh, everything that's EQ is EQL. Notice EQL is sort of an abbreviation of equal. There are a whole bunch more equality operators, which we'll get to. The difference between EQ and EQL is that certain numbers and characters may be EQ or may not, depending on the implementation, and but will be EQL. So two integers, 10 and 10, will always be EQL. In some implementations, they may not be EQ. In other implementations, they may be. And you can't depend on integers being EQ, the same integer being EQ. But you can depend on them being EQL. Um, arithmetic functions, just quickly, just going through some standard common list functions. Uh, take any number of arguments. So for um, plus, add all the values together. For minus, subtract. Take the first argument after the minus and subtract all the rest of them from it. Or if there's just one argument, make it minus. Um, so uh, star, uh, multiply everything together, divide, divide the um, second uh, into the first, and then the third into the result of the first and second, and so on. Um, creating a list, you can use the function list. And it evaluates all these arguments. So we've quoted all these, and we get the whole range of Microsoft editing our quotes. Um, but most of them should be that straight quote results in this is a list. You can also quote a list like this. But technically, what you've created here is a constant. Um, and here are just two examples of lists which aren't going to result in lists when they're evaluated because they're doing something else. This will result in the function being created and the, uh, and the symbol naming it being returned. This will result in that number five. When I say this, I realize I'm pointing to the screen. I hope you're, which you can't see, but I hope you can follow which form I'm talking about. Now, let's just do printed output quickly. There are a number of print functions. They look like print object to print. and there's also a function called format, which is very powerful. So here's the difference between print. Um, the function print and the function print1 are essentially identical, except print, as you can see, puts in an extra blank line. Uh, print C differs from print or print1 in that it will not print special characters like double quotes. And so you print the string without the surrounding double quotes. The thing is that print and print1 produce printed representations that can be read back. Print C produces a pretty printed representation, a little bit more readable, but you can't read it back in the list and get the string back. Uh, formatted output, and we just give you a complicated example here, which um, we're going to go into this in the next lecture. But we just want to show you what's possible with format. So the arguments to format are the first argument says, where should I print this? And t means just to the terminal. Um, the second argument is what's called a control string. And the third and the rest of the arguments are the values to the control string. And those are picked up by these tilde S's and tilde A's and tilde 5.2 F and tilde D. But what we're just showing off is the power. So notice that when it, the last value is 1, we get John. Tilde S means as if with print. So it has the double quotes. And Mary. Uh, tilde A means without the double quotes, so Mary doesn't have them. Paid the $25.99 for one puppy, or paid $25.99 for two puppies. 
and the system did the plural correctly. That's the point of that. We're going to go into the, you don't have to learn this, it's just sort of showing off at this point. Uh, input, you typically read um, uh, into list, it reads a single list value. We're going to reading, I'm just sort of going through these last things. Output, we've already looked at print, and here's an example will be used in the homework. Lisp is a rich language, lots of predefined functions. Um, I'm going to say this thing about applications later, um, so uh, um, we'll just get to that later. Just to mention that if you're running Lisp, you should get patches. Here, when you uh, get a copy of this, it's got some references to books which are useful. And the next one, next week, to uh, 10 a.m. on Wednesday, the next two-hour presentation, uh, two more presentations, lecture notes available here. Please, if you have any questions, send mail to training at franz.com. And that was it. Thank you very much for attending today.